Hello and welcome. I'm Helen Atkinson, Senior Editor at Supply Chain Brain. I'm excited to be moderating this webinar today, sponsored by Locus Robotics, the topic for which is creating an efficient and dynamic warehouse with collaborative robots. I think we all know we're in the middle of a labor shortage that's not going away anytime soon, and adding humans to warehouse operations is simply not an option for most businesses. But by implementing collaborative robots, warehouses now have the means to consistently achieve optimal productivity in a scalable manner that addresses current and future dynamic fulfillment environments. Today, we're gonna to learn how collaborative robotic solutions can be flexible, productive, and resilient. After we get an introduction to this topic from Locus Robotics, we're gonna have a panel session with our two speakers. Then we'll move to a Q&A session with questions from the audience, that's you. Please submit questions at any time using the tab at the bottom of your screen. We will not be using people's titles or company names, so you can go ahead and ask anything you like. If you don't see your question answered during the webinar, please be assured the Locus Robotics team will reach out to you offline. Right, let's get to our speakers. Sophie Pagalde is Director of Product Ma Marketing at Locus Robotics, where she has worked since 2020 as the champion for autonomous mobile robots also known as AMRs. She is responsible for crafting the messaging, scalable growth models, and go-to-market strategies for Locus. Then we have Dan Coote. He is Global Product Manager at Locus Robotics. Before joining Locus, he spent close to six years at DHL in operations management, development, and product management. Right, without further ado, I'm going to hand off to Sophie from Locus. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Locus, we wanted to start with a short video that uh, really goes over how we work with collaborative robots and some of the benefits that um, organizations are seeing these days. You're looking to improve warehouse productivity, but not all robots are the same. Some systems are inflexible and require large investments. Others limit performance by forcing pickers to follow slow robotic carts. Only one solution has the intelligence and flexibility to help achieve the highest levels of productivity. This is Locus Robotics, the solution that thinks outside the cart. Locus frees your workers from cumbersome carts, dramatically reducing wasted walking time. Locus uses multiple nimble robots that deliver greater capacity and productivity for your warehouse. Let's take a look at how Locus's multi-bot solution works. Locus's intelligent clustering algorithm continuously reviews orders from your WMS to maximize productivity and chooses orders to optimize work density. At induction, Locus directs the associate to use the optimal pick container. It then dynamically calculates the smartest path through the warehouse and proceeds to the first pick where your associate meets the bot. The bot displays the pick information on an easy to read display in the associate's preferred language. Your associate picks the item, scans it with the integrated scanner and places it in the appropriate bin. Here is the real game changer. With Locus, your associates don't follow the robot. After the pick, the bot directs the associate to the next closest robot for more work, while the robot moves to its next task, often with a different associate. Your associates engage with multiple robots to complete more tasks faster. With Locus, you get true task interleaving, with associates able to easily switch between picking and put away. Locus continuously evaluates your order pool, associate proximity, and even congestion, resulting in shorter cycle times and greater productivity to better meet your SLAs. There is no need to log in, slow down, or carry other devices because the robots are shared resources that bring the work to your associates. You can use any combination of container types, including your existing containers or shipping cartons. The bots charge automatically and can work around the clock. And Locus is flexible automation, allowing you to easily scale seasonally. 
just add bots. Locus's innovative industry-leading reports, dashboards, and analytics give your team the powerful, actionable information that they need in real time, helping you drive continuous improvement. Proven and reliable, Locus robots are working to pick a wide variety of products in warehouses around the world, where clients see two to three times greater productivity and achieve measurable ROI in just a few months. Best of all, you can be up and running in as little as four weeks. And you're never on your own. Our customer success team is always available to help you meet your changing business needs. Choose the solution that takes your fulfillment to the next level. Choose Locus, the solution that thinks outside the cart. So I hope that I gave you an overview of how Locus works. And your what we wanted to share with you too, and I apologize. I, your it's not letting me. There we go. Um, so I'm having some issues with slides. I apologize. Okay, there we go. Um, so hopefully that gave you an overview of how Locus works um, in the warehouse. And there's also still reality out there, which is we're still seeing that most of the warehouses are still very manual. Um, you know, this is kind of the perfect scenario for us to really come in and uh, support the operation with collaborative robotics. Um, because one of the things that we see is that when you see kind of this environment today, uh, very manual and really having the, the workers walk around the warehouse, uh, pushing carts, it is inc incredibly um, hard for workers um, to, to maintain this job. And I'm sure all of you are, are experiencing these challenges with labor where retaining labor, uh, even attracting labor is a challenge uh, given the strain on the body, um, the amount of, of walking that, that the, uh, the workers have to do. Um, and it's just not as engaging as we're seeing with, with robotics. Uh, so there's also a lot kind of an impact on, I'm sure you, you know, on, on your operation as well in terms of the productivity we're seeing um, that this manual process uh, really doesn't allow customers to achieve the SLAs and the customer expectations are uh, in the market today. Um, and it's also really hard to scale when you look at seasonal peaks or even demands in, um, in volumes as well. We especially saw this obviously coming out of the pandemic when e-commerce accelerated um, and we're continuing to see this. The, that acceleration that has happened is continuing and uh, demand is growing and being able to add capacity to, the, to your warehouse so that you can really um, ship all those orders on time it becomes a challenge when the labor is not available um, and also when you know, the, the response time is, is not there. So um, this is really what we're helping our customers with um, you know, initially, but we're seeing as kind of a byproduct of implementing robotics as well, is that this manual process then does not provide a lot of data to customers either in terms of what's happening in real time in the warehouse and how the work is getting done. Um, so we want to really share with you today uh, how that, what that looks like um, for our customers and you know what a what an implementation of robotics at scale uh, really can help you achieve. Uh, this is an example of one of our customer sites. You can see hundreds of robots really running around. Uh, we've implemented about um, a, a couple hundred uh, sites so far. Uh, we have about eighty customers globally, and we're seeing more and more of these deployments where you know we're kind of past that pilot. Um, stage really in terms of implementing robotics and we're seeing that customers see the benefit and they want to continue to expand and scale. And one of the things that you'll see here is that this is a very flexible type of automation, right? So the robots uh, can move around, are very nimble, they can move around the warehouse, uh, they can perform a lot of different tasks and collaborate with the humans. Um, and they're collecting data as they're going through the warehouse as well. Um, and Dan will, uh, will, and I will also share with you more about kind of what that, that reporting looks like, what kind of data you can expect. Uh, but we're constantly in real time, really kind of assessing what's happening in the environment as well uh, to, to make sure that we're really completing every single task uh, the most efficient way. Um, so with that, I'm going to share, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Dan, who's going to talk to you a little bit about kind of how automation where robotics works and then some of the benefits that customers are seeing. Thanks very much, Sophie. Um, good afternoon, good morning to everyone on the call. Um, so 
this is an overview of, of our solution. I think really what makes our solution unique um, is that common execution platform that sits across. So ultimately our, our software. So our software has integrated with a wide variety of WMSs in, in the market. Um, and from there, effectively, we take your orders and we're able to do a, a variety of use cases with them. So um, from each and batch picking um, all the way through to put away and replenishment, um, as well as then case picking and point to point transport. And then we also have the ability to ultimately um, integrate and collaborate with um, solutions like PackSize as well, some of our partners in the market, so that we're offering a, really the end to end um, offering. So all the way from put away through to uh, your orders going out the door. That's what we can offer uh, as part of our, our, our Locust solution. Um, and then I think that the data that Sophie touched on earlier related to what you can draw from a manual solution, um, that's that's where we can offer some, some real value and real data insights into uh, ultimately how your warehouse is operating, uh, but also to um, how we're using our solution. Um, jumping on to the next slide. Um, sorry, I'm having issues jumping on to the next slide. Ah, perfect, thank you. So um, we've seen typically um, a two-time unit um, picked improvement uh, when we go into to customer sites, so improving uh, productivity by, by twofold. Uh, we have seen as much up to, to threefold. But ultimately, this depends on what your starting base is. is if, if you've got a, a mature site uh, with a good baseline, um, then obviously that expectation of 3x is, is not likely. Um, but if you've got something that is less mature, um, then we can see up to, to 3x. Um, but also some of the benefits, we see a 3x uh, cycle time within there. Um, and, and you can start to really see the comparison between um, operating with our solution versus without our solution in place. And then ultimately, what does this mean from um, an employee uh, and manager point of view? So from an associate uh, or colleague point of view, um, we're seeing much higher levels of engagement than what you would see in, in a manual operation. Ultimately, people love working with, with our robots. Um, I, I think virtually every operation that we have, most operations name uh, their bots. Um, and there's that real sense of kind of interest and camaraderie uh, around um, the bots and associates. So people don't generally kind of see what you would have with barriers uh, associated with ro robotics and automation, where it's kind of there to replace jobs. Um, people really love our solution um, and really engage with it. Um, the next point on there really is all about um, kind of improved retention. So we know during peak periods that um, it's really difficult to get hold of the labor and, and keep them in place um, by offering that more engaging um, working environment for associates. We've seen improved intention, uh, re retention across the board. Um, and as you know, the, the cost of then uh, churning that, that, that labor um, extensively is very high. Um, and then a safer um, working environment. So one of our implementations in, in the UK, uh, Boots actually saw a 77% reduction in um, health and safety incidents um, with the introduction of our uh, robots versus having a manual solution in place. So we have a proven track record of, of safety with our solutions. Um, and they are, they are very collaborative, working in some very close proximity with, with people in that environment. Um, and then from a, a management point of view, so ultimately the next level up is kind of your, your shift manager and ops managers. They have real-time visibility. So rather than having to go through uh, your WMS, running historical reports, and then having to look retrospectively at the previous day, what you're able to do with our solution is see in real time how people are operating that day. Ultimately, if you're not going to meet the, the throughput, you can make adjustments according to what the data is telling you, um, at which our customers really like and can see the benefit of. Um, all of those, all of that real-time visibility is uh, en enabled on either an Android view on, on your phone or equally some of the dashboards like you see on screen where uh, we provide some televisions um, within your facility um, and you can look up at these uh, various views uh, that offer those insights. Um, and then the last point on here really is about um, kind of focus on optimization. So 
And not only does this give your managers uh, that visibility uh, in which to drive performance, but we uh, don't just implement our, the solution and then uh, we're gone. Uh, we are a partnership approach. So over the lifetime of your contract, we're ultimately going to be with you through that. So our customer success team uh, will be working closely with you as well as other key stakeholders in Locus to make sure that you're driving optimization. And ultimately the concept of operation that we build a business case on with you is realized and not only realized, but fulfilled and pushed beyond uh, what was originally agreed upon a, a day one. And that, thank you very much. That's fantastic. I'll hand over to Helen. Thank you, Dan. That's, that was really interesting. But Dan and Sophie, I, I have to say, uh, I think those robots look really cute. I want to work with them. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to our panel discussion now with, with these two experts who are going to together dig deeper into the transformative use of collaborative AMRs in, in the warehouse. Um, and uh, I want to I start by asking you, Sophie, um, what are the key drivers for operations? Uh, what, what motivates people to pursue robotics automation? Yeah, so we just shared a little bit about labor, right? So labor, as you as you mentioned at the beginning too, Helen, is, is really the biggest challenge. I mean, we, we used to see customers really wanting to um, definitely improve productivity, you know, with the labor that they had in place. But today what we're seeing too, there's a big challenge in terms of adding capacity. So again, as those volumes increase, um, and you need to get more throughput out of your warehouse. Uh, we're seeing that uh, it's very challenging to do when the labor market is what it is and it's very hard to bring people on. So, um, you know, being able to add that capacity and then almost uh, kind of find that um, sort of uh, way that you can predict almost how many more robots you need to add that capacity even during peak, right? Because once you have the robots working in the warehouse, then you know that if you add this many more, this is how much more you can produce. So it really kind of accelerates, um, you know, the throughput as well. So customers can really need um, need their SLAs. They can uh, also, you know, ship all the orders that they need to ship. Um, and then the other aspect of it really is kind of the safety of the of the workers as well. So you know, not only is it hard to attract labor, but it's hard to retain labor. And being able to provide a safe environment um, is, is critical for, for customers today. Um, and then also, honestly, we're finding that people love working with robots. You just said you would love to work with those robots. Um, yeah. And we find that it's, you know, it makes it engaging for them. It makes the, the job just more interesting because you can say, you know, working with robotics, especially for, you know, some of the younger generations coming into, sure. in, you know, into uh, the labor yeah, market as well. So uh, we just see it. As a, as a benefit overall for customers to to add um, robotics to really solve some of these concerns. Right, so, so it's cool technology. And, and I gather that you guys, uh, often your customers will have bot naming contests, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we really work closely with customers on how we onboard, um, you know, kind of their, their workforce as well, and how do we introduce them to the robots. And we want them to feel comfortable that, you know, the robots are not here to take their jobs, but they're here to collaborate with them and really work with them. And so we've done some fun things like working on naming uh, contests. I know Dan has an anecdote from DHL that he wanted to share too. Oh, great. Yeah, Dan, absolutely. about that. <laughs> so the 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 supply uh, CEO of supply chain of um, DHL is called Oscar the Bot, um, and uh, so uh, appro appropriately uh, he had a, a robot named after him, um, Oscar the Bot. Um, so and he actually had a, a a recent a recent picture that went viral on on LinkedIn uh, of him meeting his doppelganger here in the UK. Oh, fantastic. That's great. Yeah. We also see people dress the bots up. So for the holidays, they'll put hats on uh -huh. them, you know, and, oh, and wow. they really truly see them as a as a co-worker. You know, um, DHL also just launched a campaign called the Ultimate Sidekick, and it's really all about our robots and how they work with, with their workers. Um, so we really see, you know, people embracing the robots, again, as a co-worker, as that, um, you know, helpful hand, right? Someone that's going to be their sidekick and, and really help them uh, get through the workday, really. Right. Wonderful. I want to dig a little bit further into that in a minute, but I want to just get back to, to you, Dan, and saying, you know, what are the sort of key drivers? What are the breaking points? When you when you go to a customer and they said, okay, we're going to, we're going to automate, 
what are the the sort of uh, prompts that that make somebody think it's time to do that? Do you, do, are there typical ones, or is it different for each each uh, organization? I, I think it varies, um, but but ultimately the, the, the key one that, that is consistent is it's about meet, meeting throughput levels that either. Um, have become too difficult to sustain based on um, some of the, the challenges that we spoke about. Labor is uh, norm, the normal one, um, but equally kind of given the eruption in uh, kind of e-com over the last five years, it's that level of growth and, and particularly around peak periods, peaks have got so, so large that um, these facilities for a six to eight week period simply can't cope with the volume um, and, and the number of people that they're required to get into their facilities during that, as well as the associated costs to do that. Um, so more and more, um, I, th those are the primary drivers, but equally one of the things that um, is emerging is because e-com is so demanding, uh, in which to operate in that environment. Um, we're seeing customers come into us where almost regardless of cost, they're wanting a robotic solution wow. just so that they can hit uh, their peak numbers because peaks are so valuable to, to these customers that they can't afford for um, the unpredictability that comes with having a, a manual operation. Um, and our, our bots help to provide that stability and that predictability that you need um, during those really high through, uh, throughput periods. But also, um, I think if the last two years has taught us anything, um, it's the unpredictability that these peaks can really come out of nowhere. So uh, a great example of that is Boots in the UK and I, where uh, when the pandemic started, um, they are um, out, out of season, as it were, out of peak. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, the pandemic started and they went uh, to basically peak, peak volume straight away. Uh, luckily, they had already uh, our, our peak bots still on site and they were about to send them back and they basically kept them um, and, and managed to sustain that. And that was a, a key help to, to Boots in order to satisfy that volume at the start of the pandemic and, and equally sustain it all the way through. Right. And I, I, my understanding is that one of the drivers of, of the uh, or one of the characteristics of increased e-commerce is that you have smaller orders to Phil, so they become very labor intensive and efficiency becomes even more important. And I think it's, it looks like the robots are, are particularly good for that sort of, you know, um, increased picking rate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then I think I would also add that just, um, you know, the ability to adapt, right? So again, like one thing we've learned in the last couple of years has been, you know, it's unpredictable. So building that resiliency in the warehouse is critical these days being able to adapt to whatever comes your way, um, you know, maybe the type of order that you need to fulfill, maybe the volume that you need to fulfill. Um, but, you know, when you think about kind of traditional automation versus, you know, more flexible automation like robotics, the, the great thing about flexible automation and, and robotics is that you can add more, you know, robots to the space and, and do more, more versus, you know, traditional, you know, kind of environment you can't very quickly rip out steel and, and put more, you know, infrastructure in, right? That takes time. And so if you have to respond and all of a sudden you have to increase that throughput, uh, it becomes a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. So I wanted to, to move on a little bit about specifically where can collaborative robots add value in the warehouse? Um, Dan, I, I know that uh, Locus just did a report with Forrester about the economic impacts on customers who implemented Locust Robotics. Um, so maybe, obviously there's some uh, financial gains, but maybe we could talk about that and, and the more operational uh, value that collaborative robots add. Yeah, absolutely. So um, other than looking cute, as you, as you mentioned, um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they do provide some value as well. So th there's the obvious one, um, which is uh, the business case um, that ultimately, because we increased uh, productivity by kind of two, three X, um, depending on the facility, um, you're going to see uh, a business case improvement and equally a quick, uh, a quick ROI because we charge a one-time implementation fee and then uh, we have a robotics as a service module. So there's not that CapEx strain um, on your business in which to get going on robotics. Instead, we provide a, a rental service here. Um, so that that's really um, kind of uh, the first driver. But as I mentioned um, in, in, in your last question you asked, that 
equally, we're getting to the point where people are almost business case aside, uh, wanted to have robotics simply to have that stability um, and predictability that um, our, our solutions can provide, uh, provide over a peak period um, or throughout the year. Um, but then also, I think as our kind of one of our earlier slides showed, it's not just picking, um, it's that end-to-end -end operational um, solution value. It's almost looking, picking off the picking off the roof of a building um, and looking really inside what's that end-to-end -end workflow that you see in pretty pretty much every every single warehouse. And collaborative robots um, and our solution can provide value end-to-end. Uh, whether that is uh, doing the actual task itself uh, in collaboration with the associates and managers in that facility, or equally pairing with um, some of the partners and, and some of the other technology that's that, that's in there. So uh, pack size is a, is a great example of that. So us handing off the pack size um, and providing an efficient pick and pack solution. Right. Sophie, what, what, what other uh, value adds do you see? Yeah, so Helen, you mentioned that we're going to be sharing that DEI report at the end as well for everyone who wants to read it. But um, we did go through a pretty in-depth analysis with Forrester to understand what were some of those cost savings, but then also the impact on the operation. And, and Dan shared that some of those during his, his presentation. I mean, we see that two, three X productivity improvement. We see those cycle times, um, you know, getting faster and faster. And then you know, what, something that we're diving into uh, more now too is, is the safety aspect and, and there's costs associated with that, right? So there's workers comp, you know, um, claims and things like that, that, you know, customers are able to avoid. So not only does it keep the labor, you know, safe, but it also, um, you know, there is a cost savings in terms of being able to, to retain the labor, right? Because it's incredibly expensive to also go replace that labor, uh, but then also keep them safe so that you're not having to deal with accidents, um, you know, and uh, and other uh, types of uh, safety concerns that that may cause the operation to you know to kind of be, to be disrupted in some way. But I think this is a great point in terms of the retention of labor as well. And uh, we didn't touch on the, the the data piece, but the data piece is mm, is really yeah. important because actually not only uh, are managers able to engage with their employees more and manage on a on a real time basis as well as a daily basis which gets then associates interested in how are they actually performing. Um, like the amount of manual facilities I've been into where I've walked up to an associate and asked, what's your target, UPH or LPH? And they have no idea versus going into one of our um, operations and, and asking an associate that is right there on screen. They can see where they are against that target. And uh, in many cases, a lot of sites run competitions around being the top picker. Um, and, and, and people get a real interest that, um, associated with, with, with our bots as, as a result of um, that gamification and that real-time uh, data that we provide. Yeah, Fantastic. and that's critical too, Dan, if I uh, can add to, because you know the way we look at data is how do we really enable different types of people that need to have access to that data, right? Mm. So there's you know, there's definitely kind of an executive view where you want to really look at kind of what's happening across the operation or multiple operations, right? Because you want to keep the pulse on, you know, are we meeting our SLAs? Are we meeting, you know, our, our uh, targets in terms of throughput and volume? But, you know, at the manager level, like Dan was saying, you really want to see kind of what's happening in the operation, work with your, you know, with your team there to make sure that you're really staying on track and then addressing any potential bottlenecks. But we also believe that it's important to enable the associate as well. So we have two ways that we do that. There's on the uh, on the iPad that is on the bot, uh, they're able to see where they stand, you know, for the day. So like how much work they've completed, how they're doing against themselves. So it really is gamification, but for them to really understand, you know, am I doing better? Can I do better, right? Um, but then also we provide data in terms of where the work is in the warehouse and kind of what's happening and what the robots are so that the associate also can make decisions around where do they need to go next? You know, where are they needed? Um, so it really kind of enables everyone to, uh, to address things in real time so that you're not ending, you know, the day and now realizing that, you know, you missed the mark somewhere or something didn't get done or we're now behind. Um, so it really, really helps everyone. Right, so that you're talking about uh, the, the data can be sliced and diced so that every constituent can uh, find it useful to, to, from an individual associate mm -hmm. role uh, facility manager and, and everything in between. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so Dan, um, 
I wanted to ask you, I know, you know, uh, obviously Locust Robotics is the best, but there are so many robotics out there. How should companies evaluate vendors? How do, how do they compare services? Yeah, I mean, um, I got a bit of experience uh, doing that, having come from from DHL. Um, yeah. I I think ultimately for me, uh, and, and I think many of the operators that um, that you're dealing with um, uh, would be wanting to see that solution. Um, so I would start with that. And I mean, we have a, a number of sites globally that can be visited. Uh, whether that be virtually or, or equally in person and going to see uh, and, and really seeing is believing. Um, and I, I would start with that uh, would, would be my view. Um, but equally, ultimately, the relationship you have with um, the, these uh, vendors as well, because ultimately, this is not about a, a transactional relationship. This is a partnership approach that um, you're bringing um, a, a business in for the long haul. So the majority of our contracts are, are on a three-year basis. Mm -hmm. There needs to be uh, that, that gel and that, and that commonality that we're going to provide value to, to your business. Um, and then th there's obviously the, the numbers where you're looking at the concept of operation. How does that, how does that solution pair against my facility, the expectations of what I'm going to need from a KPI and a throughput perspective, um, if it's engaging with a 3PL that then has another customer, um, how my KPI is going to, going to match against that end customer's expectation, um, as well as then ultimately, um, I think looking at it, if you're a customer with multiple uh, warehouses, I think my best advice is looking at um, that blend of uh, automation is appropriate uh, parts of your network. It's not the answer to, to your entire network and making sure that um, an AMR solution is going to provide the flexibility that you need either at a single site or within a, a, a network. Right, right. So the, the, uh, the important thing is to remember you can introduce it uh, gradually, or you can you can choose an area to automate and, and, and go in. And it sounds like that's great. So you're absolutely open to having site visits from potential customers to see how these uh, things go. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we would encourage it. Um, or if a trade show is more convenient, um, we have uh, collaborative interactive booths um, there as well. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, absolutely encourage it. Um, and equally, we've got a huge range of, of, of testimonials on our website that kind of bring that to, to life for people as well. Um, but yeah, as you said as well, um, this is something that you can start with and, and uh, you can increase uh, more so. Um, but also you can start with a, an area, let's say picking. Um, and then build off there. You can start doing put away with our solution as well. You can then mm -hmm. look at how does that integrate with, with pack size. It's a modular solution that can be built up over time, yeah. um, but equally it can be incorporated elsewhere in your network. So that's uh, something that commonly happens with our customer base. So we'll go into a single site, mm -hmm. make sure that it gels and works with their uh, operate model and their network, and then we'll expand um, throughout that customer's network into multiple sites. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, so, Sophie, I'm curious to know, I, I know that for some people, the perceptions of robotics and, and or the sort of dystopian science fiction uh, movies and whatever um, are, are, can be somewhat of a barrier. How have your customers overcome those perceptions of robotics and successfully introduced them into their operations? It, it, it sounds like the answer is hire young people but I'm sure there are other answers too. Yeah, no, no. I would say that the robots work well with with all, uh, you know, all ages or all types of people. I mean, I, I think you know, if if nothing else, to um, you know, really taking that that strain from like the physical aspect of the, of the work has can extend the life, you know, of you know the kind of the career of workers too, because then you're not, you know, really. Um, yeah, putting that strain on the body and really on the physical requirements. And so it actually can be even more inclusive in, in terms of kind of right. those requirements to do that job. That's a great right? point. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
But I would say, you know, definitely change man- management is important. So, you know, we first we we do believe collaborative robotics, um, you know, out of the way to go because we do believe the human still plays a very important role in in the operation. And we'd really what we're trying to do with the robots is really take that uh, that physical, you know, the, the the hard aspects of the job, like the physical strain on the body, you know, the uh, the walking the carrying heavy items, the pushing carts, you know, all of that, that makes the job not as appealing um, and not as safe, honestly, for the, for the worker. And then to allow the worker to work, to focus on what humans are really good at, which is completing the task in an accurate way, right? So the the humanist is really in charge of making sure that, that they're picking the correct item, that they're putting the, the, you know, the item in the, in the right location, things that, you know, humans are really good at because they have multiple ways to check that that's being done accurately. Right. Um, so we really want to enable, uh, you know, and, and empower the associate, elevate their role. So they're really seen as a valuable resource and, and, you know, again, something that humans can only do. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's important that, um, that, you know, the way that you introduce the robots into your organization, that you do it in a way that, everyone understands that and that they don't feel like there's going to be cuts or, you know, I, I feel like anytime that you're not clear about exactly how this is going to be introduced and, and what that means, uh, obviously there's going to be fears, you know, everyone, every, everyone goes through that when there's a change in the workplace. And so we really work closely with our customers on that, you know, all the way from management to making sure that they have the right tools to, and the right, com- you know, way to communicate this to, to the associates. Um, and in that hand holding is important, um, you know, and then for them to, to feel like this is a tool for them. Um, and again, it's not here to replace them. Fantastic. Dan, what, what do you have to say about it? Cause you, you're, you're more on the, in the coal face of uh, dealing with implementations. Um, have you had customers, customers, uh, find novel ways to get over people's fear of change, man, fear of change? Yeah, I think I'm um, linking to kind of what, what Sophie's been saying. Really, we're quite dependent on um, our, our customers to, to do a good job of doing this because it's all about from our sales cycle through to then if a deal is signed, we then hand over to the customer success organization who will hold a kickoff. Um, and really, one of the things that we try and do is create a stakeholder map of from a, a facility. This is your typical facility. So your planning manager, your ops manager, your health and safety manager, et cetera. And we'll look and expect those people to be involved at, at that point. And if they're not, we'll be asking questions as to why not. Because the, the last thing we want to do is turn up uh, when we get into UAT and testing and these bots all turn up on site and the site mm-hmm. has no idea uh, as to why we're there, uh, <laughs> right. what we're doing. And, sure. uh, and that's happened. Um, and and uh, that, become, okay. that becomes, a, that, that becomes a, 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 a real barrier um, because obviously sure. we've then got to work and convince those people as to why, why we're there, how we're going to benefit the, the facility. Um, whereas if that's all done up front, um, people really become kind of champions of the solution. Right. Um, like we, we've got a, a huge customer base where we have champions across the board that are huge advocates of, of, of our solution. Um, as a result of the way that we uh, engage with people, help them to understand our solution um, and, and show them how, how it works and how it can benefit them. Wow, thank you. That's really interesting. So let's talk about implementation at scale. Um, so say you've got a typical customer, they've, they've just introduced uh, auto- autonomous robots for picking, say, and now they want to scale up or they're facing one of these peak seasons that we were talking about earlier. What's the next step in a customer's journey with this type of automation after the initial introduction? Dan, can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, so... Um... I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, as you initially kind of scale up. Um, really, um, from uh, the initial concept of operation, we have a number of large sites. So what does large look like? Um, we have um, a number of customers um, within the Europe, EU and UK, as well as uh, in North America that are operating well over 100 bots within their facility um, across uh, over hundreds of thousands of square foot uh, of warehouse space. So Boots um, in the UK and I um, is is a really good example of that. Um, So during peak, they're up to 220 um, bots. They actually operate in a very dense area. So it's about a 60,000 square foot area. Um, And and it's a great example of um, us meeting throughput in a very dynamic environment. Um, But 
you don't have to have a solution or you don't have to have a warehouse of, uh, of that scale in, in which for, uh, to be considered um, using Locus. Like we operate um, down as low as kind of 10 bots is, is, our, is our minimum threshold um, and then everywhere in between. Um, and then of course you can kind of scale up and down uh, during peak as well. So we provide um, peak bots for um, your, the period that you determine is, is your associated peak. Um, and you just lease those bots for that period of time. And then at that period of time, they're then shipped back to, to us. So you don't have that financial burden that would normally come with automation as an example, where you ultimately design to a peak threshold. Um, and then for the majority of the year, that peak capability is never utilized. Um, you don't have the, the associated overhead with, uh, with a solution like ours based on a commercial approach. Right, and this ability to scale up and scale down is really interesting to me because one of the things it does, I think you mentioned this earlier, is sort of shift the expense from a capex, which is what's typically associated with technological improvements, into an operating expense that fluctuates according to volumes and, and, and peak seasons, and that makes a, a lot of sense to me. Um, so... Um, I think we talked a, a little bit about data earlier, but, but I wanted to just dig into it a little bit more with Sophie. Can we talk about how, how robotics augment analytics and data to help inform operations managers? Yes, absolutely. So um, I would say the biggest, the, different, the biggest difference with what you would see from a WMS, for example, is that the WMS needs those inputs to know what's happening and to be able to kind of show, you know, what is happening, like a clear picture of what's happening. But um, the WMS is not in the warehouse really, you know, it going through the aisles and understanding how the work is really getting done. We, we have that capability with the robots where they're in that physical environment and capturing data um, as to, you know, what were the, the, the tasks that were completed, how long they took, who completed the task. Because as the, the humans interact with the robots, as the robots run, you know, travel around the warehouse, they are uh, capturing those data points. And so, the data is incredibly real time, right? Um, and it doesn't take as much of that input. You know, I think that's one of the challenges with software data, right? Is that it's not, it's up in the cloud. And unless someone tells it what happened in the real world, it doesn't know. So I think that's kind of like that layer that we can provide from a data perspective. But then, um, you know, the way that we display the data is really meant to enable, like I was saying, the different uh, kind of stakeholders, right? Who need to have access to this data. So yeah. we really, we work to um, really kind of create that mission control sort of view for the managers in the warehouse. So, you know, usually they have a desk or, you know, where they can have some of those dashboards up and they're incredibly visual. You saw some on the video, but they're, uh, they're incredible visual. So it, they can really see clusters and, you know, kind of a heat map of what's happening. And so right. it's, it's, it's very user friendly in terms of quickly being able to see that data and, and act on it, right? You don't have to read through reports or, or really you know, look at tiny fonts somewhere. It really is very, very visual and, and user-friendly. And this, we do the same thing with associates. So we install displays, big displays um, you know, throughout the aisles. And this is really to help kind of the, the associate, again, kind of be in touch with what's happening in the warehouse. Um, and and we, we feel this is really critical um, in terms of giving them also the power to, to decide where they go next, how they support the operation as well. Right, sure. That's that's fantastic. So you, you can really identify problems in real time, um, among other things, uh, bottlenecks, et cetera. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I think I wanna move on now. Thank you so much to both of you. I think we'll move on to some uh, Q&A session because we've actually got some really interesting questions from, from the audience. Um, I have one here about uh, somebody who's interested in the Locus Max. That's your your heavy duty AMR. Can you talk a little bit about that, Dan? I think you could you could probably. Yeah, sure. So um, Max is part of um, last year. We we acquired a, a company called Waypoint Robotics, who um, are integrating into into our business over the course of this year. Um, and Max is is one of the bots that that came with that uh, Waypoint acquisition. Um, effectively, Max is a, is a heavy payload bot that we're going to be using for um, case picking, for uh, case replenishment, for um, full pallet picking um, as well. 
Um, we're in, in the process of, of integrating that into our overall offering. It will be available, uh, generally available from uh, next year, um, but we'll be running um, a, a number of pilots as, as we integrate that into that, uh, our business over the course of this year um, that can provide some uh, further in insight into that solution. Um, but right. really interesting solution, and ultimately it sits under um, our Locus One, which is our software platform. Um, as well as then kind of vector um, and, and the origin bots that we have as well. And does it take any longer to set up than a regular bot? No. No? Super. Um, by, so just to remind the audience, uh, please submit any questions you have using the tab at the bottom of your screen. And we won't be using people's names or titles or company names. So you should feel, to free, uh, feel free to ask whatever you like. Um, and if we don't get to your question during this session, uh, please be assured the Lo Locus Robotics people will reach out to you offline. Um, another uh, interesting question here, uh, and I think this goes back to the, the, the Max, it's, um, are there robotics options for larger containers and skid size locations? Most, uh, this particular uh, person saying most of our products are pulled by skid quantities and that sometimes uh, uh, some skids are built uh, differently from other skids. So it, is uh, Locus Max going to be the best solution for that, or are there other ways to, to deal with skids and, and uh, pallets? So we have, like Dan said, three different robots, um, and they can each handle different payload. Um, they have different payload capacity in terms of weight, but also in terms of cube. So, we usually look at it from the perspective of that cube. What do you what do you need, and also the volume that you need to move. So we actually have the robots work together, and we will assign the right robot to whatever is you know the right fit for for that task that needs to be completed based on the volume, what needs to be moved, and what the task is. Super, thank you, Sophie. Uh, another question: um, What kind of IT support or other kinds of roles do you need in order to to help support this robotic solution? Are there any specialized uh, pe people within the customer's uh, organization that are required? Um, I think not really. Um, oh. Based on the roles that you would normally have within um, a site, uh, so your ops role, your planning role, your health and safety role, um, your, your, your IT role, um, the, the, those are the key roles that we need to, to work with in order to, to get our solution in place. Obviously, mm -hmm. they're going to need to to learn how they use uh, our solution and operate in a, in a in a slightly different way to, to what they would be uh, normally. But um, yeah, our our kind of teams help with that that whole transition between moving from whatever type of solution you're using at the moment, whether it's manual or whatever it is, to to, to using uh, Locus. Yeah, maybe I'll just so to add, yeah, that, um, you know, so we have an all-inclusive RAS model and that really includes also unlimited support and li unlimited maintenance, everything that the customer needs. Unlike other solutions, we do not require someone to be on site uh, all the time to maintain oh, or support okay. the solution. Um, our solution is, it, honestly, I mean, it, it's very mature. We've been running these robots for, for years, so we've Kind of figured out all the you know the quirks and and it's working really well so there may be the occasional uh you know issue that we need to support the customer with and we have a, an incredible support team that is available 24 7 around the sun you know so it's it's not an issue customers can call us and we can uh, get someone to help them right that's really interesting yeah and i have another question here about maintenance funnily enough um are you typically doing maintenance on on site or do they have to be, or do the bots have to be taken away or just i guess it depends on what, what they need yes yeah, so we have a field service team who will um normally come on site um at least once a year in which to uh, perform some routine maintenance um if there's an issue with the bot then obviously our field service team would, would come and visit the site in which to, to resolve that um and then equally from a um kind of a, a software point of view um as part of that ras model um you have a, a customer support team 24 7 um globally that, that will support uh resolving any of that from a either from a maintenance or a problem shooting point of view 
Yeah, and right. also we can get new bots shipped out within days. I mean, we've, we've done it for customers. So if, if there's a need to replace a bot, we can get that out to them very, very quickly. Um, so cool. lead times are not an issue or anything like that. We always have inventory and um, can do that. Right, great. Let's get on to training. I've got a couple of questions about that. How much training does an associate typically need in order to work with, with the bots? Not much. It takes about 15 minutes. Anyone can do wow. it. I think we even proved it at Modex, right? We had people coming into the booth and within minutes they were able to pick. Um, wow. The user interface is, is so user-friendly. Um, it's very visual. It really kind of walks you through the steps. So you can at any point come up to a bot and know what you need to do and kind of go through those steps. Um, so that's one of the key benefits, right? Is And again, when you think about labor and kind of getting them up and running quickly, um, that's something that really helps our customers. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, uh, the benefits from a training uh, and speed to competency perspective are, are huge on our solution. Um, so who, hey, if, you, if you pick up any kind of green screen um, handheld device on, on any of your normal uh, WMSs, um, people, one, hate getting trained on them. Uh, they're normally quite complicated. And then um, it takes a while to get that, that person up to speed. Um, and they normally have, might have a buddy in which to, to help them get up to speed on that as well. Um, whereas our, our solution from that point of view is super, super straightforward. Um, and we normally see um, benefits that are baked into the business case from a training and speed to competency point of view. That's, that's fantastic. Um, we had another uh, sort, of, sort of technical question here about um, what would be the critical steps in preparing uh, the warehouse management system to link up with collaborative robots? Um, so, I mean, obviously we're going to need um, integration with, with UWMS. We've got a lot of experience with integrating with uh, the majority of uh, WMSs out there in, in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and if we haven't in uh, integrated with it, then we, we obviously have the ability to, to evaluate that. Um, but ultimately, we're going to need uh, an endpoint in order to, um, uh, to talk to the WMS. Um, and then depending on the workflow, um, that, that will build up from, from there. But we aren't seeing, and particularly WMS is now, they're seeing uh, the market for robotics are significantly reducing uh, the barriers that you might have seen. seen. Uh, so when we first got going in 2015, uh, there were some barriers to integrating with the WMS. Now it's a lot more seamless in terms of how we oh, do that, as well as, okay. uh, mm -hmm. as well as from a, a cost point of view, m much lower as well. Great, that, that's fantastic. And let me ask you, how many sites have, has Locus implemented altogether worldwide? So we're we're now at, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Sophie. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say we're almost at 200. I think that that slide needs to be updated, but yeah, we're we're at a couple hundred sites at this point. That's fantastic. And, and uh, any particular lessons learned from doing that many implementations? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, number, but I think that the, the, the key one is, um, and, and you asked us a little bit earlier around um, kind of how do we make sure people um, don't fear the, the solution. It's all about mm. customer engagement. So um, because we provide that end-to-end -end service uh, to the customers, you're always going to have a face from Locus Robotics um, that's making sure that you're engaged, that you're understanding the solution and ultimately going live with something that you're happy with and then running through the lifetime of that contract with people that you're, you're happy with. So as much as possible, we will make sure that um, there will be someone within uh, Locus Robotics that is uh, effectively um, on the other side of, of, of your questions or, or your queries and, and helping you understand the solution. Yeah, and I would also say we have an incredible customer success team. So one thing that we've learned is, you know, mm. like any solution, you just don't, you know, kind of install it and let it go, right? I mean, there's obviously that need for constantly looking at how can we do better? And we really kind of embrace that, you know, pers you know, philosophy, I guess, of continuous improvement. And we work with our customers very, very closely to make sure that once we've met that, we've met that next target that they're trying to hit, that we're really looking at what else can we improve 
Um, and this, you know, we work very closely with them on understanding their workflows. You know, are there any bottlenecks that um, that maybe we can, you know, change if we shift some of the, the flow or, you know, maybe there's something that's getting in the way. Maybe there's a conveyor that's going through it, you know, a, right. mm -hmm. a part of the warehouse that is preventing the robots from, you know, going through that straight path. Um, you know, so we're we're all constantly looking at at that and working with customers to make sure that um, that they're constantly improving and, and really reaching, you know, higher and higher uh, throughput goals and productivity goals that's fantastic wonderful well we're, we're getting a little tight on time so i'm going to ask both of you one final question and it's uh this what's the best way to get started with robotics sophie how do you get there? yeah so i would say you know i think at this point we've removed a lot of the barriers to getting started which i think is great news for our customers um you know we, we're seeing customers really come on uh live and within you know six to eight weeks so you know if you have concerns about timing i think we've, we've kind of addressed that um I, and I would say also the RAS model really helps because again, you don't have to go through that huge budget uh, approval process, right? It really is a kind of a uh, is an OPEX, uh, you know, kind of expense, and um, and it's really easy to get approved because it's it makes sense in terms of you can actually map out exactly what the ROI is going to look like. We we map out the ROI to be around like six to eight months, so it's a really it's really easy in terms of getting that budget approval, understanding that the timing, uh, you know, is going to to work out, and then also I think just really minimizing the. Um, the impact to your operation from a disruption perspective, you know, we're not requiring a lot of infrastructure changes or changes to your workflows. You can really kind of bring in the robots and they can work in the environment that you already have set up. So I would say, you know, those, those things make it easy. So if you've had any fears about any of those things, I would say, uh, talk to us because we can walk you through exactly what it's gonna look like and give you that confidence that you can get it done quickly and, um, and cost effectively. That's fantastic. All right, Dan, <laughs> how do you follow on from that? Yeah, no. So I, I, I would say um, making sure, first and foremost, you're very clear on the problem that's that's trying to be solved. Um, and then ultimately doing some, some research in the market based on what that problem is. Um, so I think, and, and we'll be very open about this, we are not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, but we do, uh, there's a significant portion of the problems uh, in, in, in the warehouse and that we can help solve. Um, and then I think uh, best for me uh, is really um, either through um, what, what's available on internet content, uh, so i.e. testimonials, videos, and, and mm -hmm. all of the rhetoric that we have on our website, or actually reaching out to, to those businesses, trying to arrange uh, either a site visit or a virtual tour of the facility, um, and then starting that, that discussion. So um, there is absolutely no harm going through the process of um, getting a coup uh, generated with, with us and understand the, is that gonna meet the business goals that, that you need? Um, that, that, would be, that would be my main advice. And then and try it out, um, uh, right. whether that's yes. a single site, mm -hmm. um, you, you're not wedded to it uh, for, for your network. Right, fantastic. So basically take, take the plunge. It sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Yep. Well, I'm afraid that's that's all we have time for today. This has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much to Sophie and Dan from Locus Robotics. And in a special thanks to all of you for participating. I think we've learned a lot today about how collaborative robotics can really improve things in the warehouse. We had a lot of questions today and we'll be answering the ones we didn't get to with you offline. You're also going to get an email later, very shortly, with a link to view the webinar on demand, and you can share it with people, um, as well as a link to that report we mentioned that Locus generated with Forrester about the economic impact on customers of implementing Locus Robotics. There'll also be contact information for Locus, of course. Thank you so much to everyone for your participation. Stay safe, stay happy, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Helen.